So this is joint work with a colleague from my department, Vinicius. And uh, in his PhD a few years ago, he worked with gene expression data. And this is kind of an open problem that he brought back. And then he invited me to try to solve it together. Uh, so my favorite thing about this work, which was the first time that it actually happened to me, is the whole thing, the whole development of the methodology was thought of and motivated by the application that we have, the, the, the applied problem that we have. So every single bit in the model and in the priors has a practical motivation, which was really interesting, a really interesting aspect of this work. So I'll start with an introduction where I'll talk about microarray technology, which is what we use to obtain the data that we have. Then I'll present the data that we have and the problem that we need to solve, that we want to solve with this data. Uh, then I'll present the statistical methodology, more specifically the model that we propose and how to perform inference for it and then the results that we got for the data that we have. So microarray technology is, is a very popular technology nowadays to obtain data about gene expression. In the next few slides, I'll try to give an idea of what a microarray really is. Uh, the data that we have was obtained in experiments that use this specific uh, microarray which is made by this company called Affymetrix. It's a very popular one, and it has generated data that was used in several works before this. So what is a microarray? Basically, it is a solid surface with 712 cells by 712, so it gives a bit more than 500,000 cells, which I'll call probes. So which one of these cells I'll call probe, and in one microarray, which has size one and a half by one and a half uh, centimeters, I have a little over 500,000 of these probes. And what they do is, for each probe, they associate a sequence of 25 nucleotides. So a nucleotide are the small parts that form our DNA, so A, T, C, G, right? So they take a sequence of 25 of these and associate one particular sequence to each one of these probes. But what they do is they take millions of replications of this sequence and put them inside this probe. So in each probe, I have one particular sequence, different probes, different sequences, but in each probe I have millions of replications of a given sequence. Once they do this, they extract a cell from, for, for example, we want to study the association, the genes associated to some types of cancer. So what you do is you take a cell from this cancer, then you take RNA fragments from this cell, and you take sequences of nucleotides also of size 25, and you put some fluorescent tags in each of the sequences, okay? Then you you put this somehow on the, on the microarrays. After you do that, you come with a laser, you apply a laser in the surface, and whenever a sequence that comes from the cancer cells binds, and it's going to bind if it matches the nucleotides from the sequence that I have in the probes, I don't need to have a perfect match, but if I have a similarity for most, most of the 25 nucleotides, it is going to bind, and this tag is going to bright. And because I have millions of the same sequence in each probe, if the matching sequence appears a lot in the DNA cells, I'll have lots of these tags brighting, and I'll have a high light intensity com coming from this probe. So what I extract from my microarray is a light intensity measured for each of these 500,000 probes, okay? So this is actual real data. It's not a picture of the microarray, but it's real data extracted from a microarray. They measure this light intensity in a way that I don't really understand, but it's, they say that it's useful to take the 
log to base of this scale, and then you get more or less the scale that you see here that goes more or less from 4 to 12. And you can see that you have places in the microarray, and you know which sequences were there that have a brighter, a higher light intensity, which means that the matching sequence occurred in great number in the cells that you extracted from the cancer. So what they do, because you have uh, noise, when you perform this experiment, you have noise coming from different sources. So one thing they do is they replicate the experiment. So once they take the cell, they, they put it in more than one microarrays. So for the data we have, for each of them we had from 59 to 250 replications. But you have noise because of scanner variation and the reading variation of the, of the light intensity. So it's useful to do some pre-processing of the data. A very popular technique to do it is this robust multi-chip average, which is available as an R package. And basically, you can do three things. We do just the first two, because we want to work with probe-level uh, probe data, so we do not summarize them. But you need to do some adjustments for noise reduction and to make the different replications from the different microarrays comparable. So what is the goal here? So that's the type of data we are going to have. For a given cell from a given type of cancer, we have replications from microarrays, and we measure, and we have for each probe in the microarray a light intensity. And if, if the light intensity is high, it means that the matching sequence that I had in the probe was present. I have lots of them in the, in the cells that come from the cancer. And why is it important to detect this gene? So a gene is a sequence of several probes will give me a gene, and it's important to know which genes from the human genome that are associated with some kinds of, with a type of cancer, okay? So we're interested in identifying in the human genome which genes are associated to certain types of cancer. And this association is measured by the the light intensity, which from now on I refer to as expression. So a high expression probe is a probe that had a, a high light intensity in the microarray. Uh, so this is a problem that was identifying genes with high expression and understanding uh, factors that are related to these were studied before in several works in the literature. But we not only want to identify these genes, but we want to know where they are in the human genome. So in which chromosome it is, and in which part of which chromosome I have that gene that ha had a high expression in my data. So we, you, I need to map the sequences that I had initially in, in my microarray into the human genome. And one popular tool that does that is called BLAT. Sorry. So it maps arbitrary sequences of nucleotides to the human genome. It's popular because it's efficient. It has a low computational cost. It, it generates some inconsistencies, but very few ones in less than 1% of the cases. So for, in our case, we're going to remove these inconsistencies, which means that which happen when one probe is aligned to more than one location in the genome, or you associate more than one probe to the same location. So we remove this, but it happens for less than 1% of the data. So not only we want to identify the high expression genes and locate them in the chromosome, but the fact that we want to locate them in the chromosome is very useful because it's known by the specialists that you expect a similar behavior of genes and probes that are close to each other in the chromosome. So the fact that we are locating, mapping them to the chromosomes now, it, it, it's like we should really use this information in our analysis. So we're going to propose a model that uses the location of the probes in the chromosome and uses the fact that you should expect similarities between closed probes. Okay? So for example, for the data that we have, that we have over 500,000 probes, once we applied BLAT, 
around 90,000 of them were mapped into the human genome. The other ones were not found, so we just ignore them. So just an illustration of what blood does. It, for each probe in the microarray, it takes this probe and searches it along the human genome until it identifies or not in which location that probe appears in the human genome. So you have all the 24 chromosomes aligned here. For our analysis, we have five data sets from five different studies which concern three types of cancer. Three of them concern breast cancer, one ovarian cancer, and the other one brain cancer. These are the number of microarray replications I have in each study. So for example, here it means that I took the cells from the cancer and I put it over 20, 251 microarrays. So that's the number of replications I have. If I take, for example, for the first data set, I take the median of these replications, so I have around 90,000 observations, and I make a histogram of the light intensities of the expressions. This is the histogram that I get. And if I look at this only for chromosome 4, otherwise you cannot see anything, only for chromosome 4, I see them aligned along the chromosome 4, and this is the light intensity. So the important things to see here is I have some quite big gaps in the chromosome to which no probe is mapped. But another important feature here that makes the thing harder is that there is no clear division, no clear gap in the light, light intensity scale. Because I want to, to identify genes with high expression. If there was a clear gap here, it would be, make my life much easier, right? So for the second graph that I presented for chromosome 4, out of the 90,000 probes, 3,500 uh, 3, more or less were assigned to chromosome 4. And if I take the scale of the chromosome, like I said, not the, the probes, not every probe is mapped to the chromosome, and you have lots of locations in the chromosome to which no probe is mapped. So if you look at the distance in the, along the chromosome between consecutive probes, you get the most irregular things because you have distances that go from one to three million, and the median is 53,000. So I said that I want to use the information that closed probes should be similar, and that should be based on this distance, but working with the distance in this scale, and which is completely irregular, is a really challenge. Trying to put this into a model and deal with it computationally is very hard. So to solve the scale problem, what we do is we, res we rescale these distances by first taking the log, which makes sense because beyond a certain point it doesn't matter, they're just too far away, so we should treat them the same, and when, so we should zoom on the smaller distances. So that's what we do with the log, and then we divide by the maximum so we take it to the interval 0, 1. So in terms of the scale, it's much easier to work now. I'll, I'll say how we deal with the fact that they are irregular, uh, a few slides. So in order to have some empirical evidence that there is really, really this spatial dependence along the chromosome, we perform the Morans 1 permutation test, which tests if there is this spatial dependence, and it basically said that this, this is the p-value, so this dependence is present in all the chromosomes. This is just for the first data set, but we got pretty much the same results for all the five data sets. So it's, it's giving us empirical evidence that what the specialists say that there should be similarities between closed probes, near probes, it makes sense. The data reflects this. This is the histogram of the rescaled distances, so now it lies between zero and one. So I want to detect regions of the chromosome genes which are formed by sequences of probes that have a high expression when I compare them to my cancer cells. So the naive solution would be to have an arbitrary threshold, and I would say for every probe for which the expression, the light intensity is above this threshold, I'll say it's, it's something that I should look at. If it's below this, I'm not going to look at it. 
But first, you saw that there is no clear gap there, so it's, it's not an obvious thing. So there are many disadvantages of performing this naive thing. So the first is, so there is no explicit gap. The scale of the measurement is not clear because it's gone through so much pre-processing that it's not so obvious, even for the specialist, what is a high expression, what is a low expression. And, of course, if you do this, you're not taking into account the important information that near probes are expected to be similar, to have a similar behavior. So the, well, so the challenges are to deal with the distances that, although are now rescaled, they are still completely irregular. We do not want to choose an arbitrary threshold. And also, we want to use two important informations from the, from the specialist, which is we expect just a minority of the probes to be, to, have, to be associated to the cancer, so less than 5%, say. And we do not want to detect one, one probe or just two probes that have high expression and for which the neighbors do not have high expression because you want to identify genes and you need more probes to have a gene. So we, we want a model that will not point out for high expressions that are isolated, for which the genes, for which the neighbors have low expression. So we want a model that takes all these issues into account. So our strategies are to use the non-correlation among near probes in the model, assume some kind of dependence, in spe specifically a mark of dependence, and of course, this should depend on the distance between the probes, but it's not so obvious how to use it because the, the distances are completely irregular. So we're going to come up with a way to, instead of saying there is this mark of dependence and it depends directly on the distance, we'll say, well, it, there may be a mark of dependence or not, and now model is stochastically this dependence. So say there is a probability that there is a mark of dependence, and I'll use the distance to model this probability. So it's a smoother way to make the mark of dependence depend on the distance. It's very com uh, convenient computationally because the distances are so irregular that dealing with the distance in the level of the, of the data in the mark of dependence would, would be really hard. The consequences of doing these things, uh, and also we want to make longer sequences of high expression more likely to be a cluster, and a cluster is exactly a sequence of a minimum size of probes with high expression. I do, do not want to, to detect small sequences of high expression. So when taking all these strategies, there will be no threshold fixed or estimated. There is no threshold involved whatsoever. And we are going to use the important information such as similarity among probes and what should be considered a probe a cluster in the model and prior specification. That's, so that's what I, what I meant when I said that every bit in the model and in the prior specification had a practical motivation. So the model. In each of our data sets, and we have five of them, I have N observations, so N light intensity measurements, and this N is around 90,000 in each of my data sets. For each data set, I have a number L of replications that will go from 59 to 250, depending on the data set. I'll define Xi as the true expression latent in location I, and the Yi's are the replications that I have, that I actually observe. I could model the variability of the replications, but the computational cost would increase so much, and I wouldn't really have much gain because the distribution of the replications is unimodal, fairly symmetric, and has a variance that it's quite small regarding the scale of the measurements. So I wouldn't really gain anything in terms of modeling and results, but the computational cost would increase a lot more than 200 times, depending on the data set. So what we do is we take the median of the replications. Why the median if it's symmetric and everything? Because eventually you can have an outlier because of an uncalibrated scanner or something like that. So it's more wise to take the median. 
So the modeling strategy to detect the cluster, so the cluster are sequences of consecutive probes with high expression. The modeling strategy is to use a mixture distribution to model the light intensities, such that in this mixture I'll have k gamma distributions and one Gaussian. The Gaussian will be the one with the highest mean, and, I, and the Gaussian will be exactly the mixture component that will identify what I want to be clustered. So whenever a probe is assigned to this Gaussian component, that means that I'm identifying this as a, as a potential cluster, as being in one potential cluster. So why gammas? Because you saw the histogram, you have more than one mode, you have skewness, so the gamma is more flexible than the Gaussian. And why the last one is Gaussian? Because it's modeling a specific thing, feature from that data, so it's expected to have some kind of homogeneity that you'd get with a symmetric distribution. This is the graphical representation of the model. So before giving you all the formulae, I'll present its graphical representation. So X are the medians of the light intensities in each location, so the actual data. Instead of putting a dependence here, I'll look at the next level of the model, which are the indicator variables that indicate from which component in the mixture this observation comes from. And I'll allow a mark of dependence on this level of the model, but instead of saying, but remember that the distances between these are completely regular. So what I do is I say, there is either a mark of dependence, and it is the same for all of them, or not, but for each pair, I say that the mark of dependence exists with the probability rho, and I use the distances to model the probabilities. So it's a smoother way to model the mark of dependence as a function of the distance. And it's very convenient computationally because the distances are completely irregular. So making the, the model formal, given the indicator variable, it says to, in which company which component from the, the mixture my observation comes from. So the first k are gamma distributions. Our parameterization is theta is the mean, and eta is the scale. The last component is a Gaussian distribution, the one that is going to accommodate the, the clusters that I want to identify. To avoid label switching, I will order the means. And the Gaussian has the largest mean because of everything I said before. For the Z, so the indicator variable of which mixture company the observation comes from, I say that with probability rho i, there is a mark of dependence. So with probability rho i, Z follows a mark of chain with a transition, with a transition uh, matrix Q. So small q k is the kth row of this uh, transition matrix. And with probability 1 minus rho, there is no dependence. Z is independent from all the other Zs. To model the probability of having a mark of dependence, I use a probability regression on the distances. Of course, we want this beta 1 to be negative, so that the closer the probes are, more likely it is that they are Markov dependent. That's the kind of information that we have to put in our priors. Because we're doing things computationally, in specifically we're going to have an MCMC, so it's inevitable that you have to deal with the hierarchical representation of the mixture, which means that you have to introduce Bernoulli auxiliary variables that indicate if the mark of dependence exists or not, and it's going to be a Bernoulli row one. I mean, that's only for computational purpose. The model is the same. We use standard conjugate priors whenever they exist, and we have conjugate priors for all the parameters except the scale parameters of the gammas. So we just use a gamma, but there is no conjugate analysis for the scale parameter. For all the other ones, these priors are very convenient because it will give us a full conditional distribution in the same class from which we can sample with no problem. So I've introduced most of the information that I wanted in the model. 
but there's still two of them remaining, which is you only expect a minority of probes to be detected as clusters, and I want to make it more likely to have longer sequences of probes being detected. I still haven't put this information in the model, and I'll be able to do that through the priors of the queues, so when I specify R0 and RK. And I'll show exactly which the choices that we make when I, when I show you the analysis. So Bayesian inference, we perform Bayesian inference, so it's a, so we use the Bayesian paradigm, we want the full, co full posterior distribution of all the unknown components in the model. It's a really high dimensional distribution, very complex, so what we do is we do MCMC, in particular Gibbs sampling with a metropolis step only for the scale parameters from the gamma. And given the complexity of this posterior and the high dimensionality, you have to be very wise to choose your blocking scheme in the Gibbs sampling so that you don't have a very high autocorrelation in the function, so you have convergence in a feasible time. And that's what we try to do. One of the things that we do is we introduce these well-known auxiliary variables for the probit regression from Albert 92, which allows you to sample the regression coefficients from directly from their full conditional, because if you put normal priors, the full conditional will be normal. And we define four blocks, four sampling blocks for the Gibbs sampling. The first one is composed by all the Zs and all the W variables. Remember, Z is the indicator of the mixture company, and W is the mixture component, and W is the indicator of the mark of dependence. We sample them all together from their joint distribution. All, I mean for all the N locations. So there is 180,000 variables here. All the Vs, all these parameters together, and the scale parameter. Why is it possible to, to sample jointly from such high dimensional distributions? Because I have lots of conditional independence for, for, for this. So I can actually sample for, from very low dimensional ones, but because of the conditional independent, I'll be actually sampling from the joint distribution. This is very good because, for example, these variables are really highly, it's expected that they're really highly correlated. And if you sample them together, this autocorrelation is not going to be jeopardized in your MCMC. But there is a small problem with this. I mean, a small, there is actually big because this chain is non-irreducible, so it does not converge to the invariant distribution of the chain. But the solution is simple. You can you simply integrate V out from the full condition of Z and W. It's called the collapse Gibbs sampling. Then the chain will become irreducible. It will preserve convergence to the invariant distribution and will allow us to sample directly from this full condition. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip a bit faster here. So it's very easy to sample these distributions because of conditional independence. I have uh, conjugate priors here, which make things easy as well. The most challenging step is the one for Z and W. So what we do is we write this joint distribution, we, we factorize it as the product of these conditional distributions. And we, if we know all these conditional distributions, we can sample this forward in time following this order. And in order to obtain these distributions, all we have to do is a backward filtering of the probability vectors. So that's what we do. We do a backward filtering forward sampling. This is the backward filter, and this is the forward sampling. Cluster detection, once you run, you have the output from the MCMC, you can just evaluate probabilities of given probes being in, a, in the Gaussian component of the mixture. So just compute some ergodic average of indicator functions. And here are the results. So we have five data sets. In each of them, 90,000 observations. We do the analysis for each data set for all the 24 chromosomes. We assume that there is no dependence between the last probe in one chromosome and the first probe in the next one, which makes sense and it's very good computationally because basically 
tells you that you can perform your BFFS separately for each chromosome, which is by far the most expensive step in the MCMC. So you can, for example, parallelize this, which should be really convenient. We do a sensitivity analysis for K, and we choose K equals 4 because it's the one where the important component in the mixture stabilizes. Here are the choices for those important parameters that I told you about. So they should reflect the information that I only expect a minority of the probes to be detected, and I only want to detect a given sequences of a given minimum size. So this explains the I want just a minority. These numbers need to be large because for each chromosome I have a few thousand observations, and I have to have information in this prior, and you can measure the information of a Dirichlet prior by summing the, the parameters of this distribution. The numbers are not rounded here because we use the round number for k equals 3, and we wanted to preserve the same information, so when we made the transformation we got decimal numbers. And what this is saying is, it's very hard to move to the Gaussian component, but once you're there, it's likely that your neighbor is going to be there. So what this does is, it says, I only detect, it's more likely to detect a sequence of probes being a cluster if the sequence has a minimum size. So this prior plays a very important role in the, in the analysis. The other prior are standard. We even performed sensitivity analysis and the results are very similar. I put a relatively inf uh, informative prior for the beta one because I want it to, to be negative. Here are the mean and standard so posterior statistics for the parameters in the mixture components. So the f all the, th the five data sets, all the four gammas, and the Gaussian, this is the important one. And you can see that the results are quite similar across the different data sets. Here are the posterior weights for each component in the mixture. The last one is the Gaussian, also very similar and very close to what we wanted, so a bit less than 5%, so it's around 4%. So 4% of the probes were assigned to the Gaussian component, so were detected as being in a cluster of high expression. This is the, the adjustment of the mixtures for each of the five data sets. So the, the red one is the Gaussian. So you see a very similar behavior as well. Here is the same chromosome 4 that I showed in the beginning, but now I colored in red all the probes that had a probability greater than a half of being in the normal component. So if, if you look hard, you can, you can notice that there are some black dots that are above some of the red dots, because probably these are isolated points that I do not want to detect as being in a cluster, because they do not actually form a cluster. I also investigate similarities among the different data sets. The analysis are all separate for all of them. And what these percentages means is take breast one and breast two data sets, take all the probes that were assigned to the normal component in at least one of them. Out of these, 79% were assigned to the normal in both of them. Right? So you can see that there is great similarity between them. It is the, they are more similar among the breast cancer data data sets, a bit less with the ovarian and even less with the brain, which is something really reasonable and shows that, that we should be doing the right thing. Here I have the graph of the posterior probability of being in the Gaussian component, so belonging to a cluster, for all the probes just in chromosome 1 first, so you can have an idea a closer idea of what it looks like, and if I put all the 24 chromosomes together this is what it looks like. So these lines are pointing me locations in the chromosome where I sh should pay more attention that indicate that should, there should be genes that are associated with that type of cancer. You can see that it's very similar, the data sets, right? So concluding, we used the uh, HMMs in gene expression data coming from microarrays. The goal was to identify genes in the human genome that are associated with some types of cancer. The blood was used to align, to map the, the probes in the chromosomes. We had five data sets from three types of cancer. 
We use the mixture distribution with four gammas and one Gaussian, which was the one that accommodated the clusters. We use the distance to explain the mark of dependence. Results were quite reasonable based on what we saw. Around 4% of the observations of the probes were detected as being in potential clusters of interest. And we found some interesting great similarities among the five data sets. What we're doing now is we're trying to do the same thing, but not from data coming from microarray, but coming from RNA sequence data, which is basically you take the cell from the cancer and you have a tool that has a, a database of sequences and it counts how many times that sequence appears in that fragment of the cell. So it generates count data, but really crazy data. So it's really challenging as well. This is the main reference of the work. All the other references that I gave you can find uh, in, in, in this paper. That's it, thank you. <laughs>